Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Titus, chapter 3, beginning with the fourth verse. It's in your song. It's only the front and back of one page. Let's see. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Back in the bad old days when I was still working in law enforcement, I used to run the radar a lot. I was assigned traffic a good portion of the 17 years I was in that business. One day I was sitting on the side of the road, watching for speeders as one does when running the radar, and along comes this car, and the radar says 22 miles an hour. Granted, you, it was a 55 mile an hour zone. Well, it occurred to me, you know, that going way too slow was just as dangerous as going way too fast. So I decided I would pull this person over and find out what was going on there. As I walked up to the car, I saw that there were five, actually six, but five sweet little old ladies, two in the front, three in the back, all of them pale as ghosts. The driver, on the other hand, was animated. And she was also confused. As I walked up, she broke down the window and said, Officer, I don't understand. I was doing the speed limit. And I said, Man, you weren't speeding. But going too slow was just as dangerous as going too fast. You were going way beneath the speed limit. She said, Below the speed limit, I was not. I was going exactly the speed limit, 22 miles an hour. That's when it hit me. We were on Highway 22. <laughs> so I told her, no ma'am, that's, that's not the speed limit. That's the highway number. The speed limit is 55. He said, oh, no. I said, oh, yes. You can go a bit faster than this. But before I let you go, ma'am, I, I really have to ask, are these other five ladies okay? They are pale as ghosts and stiff as stones. What's going on? She says, don't worry about them officers. They'll be fine. We just got off Route 119. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how I wish I had seen her on Route 119. <laughs> but hope springs eternal. That's what they say. Last year, it occurred to me, in the middle of the Advent season, that I had never preached a series of sermons based on the Advent candles, hope, peace, joy, and love. Well, I'm not going to this year either, it seems. So you see, I'll be on vacation the second Sunday in Advent, and then there's a cantata the third Sunday in Advent, so maybe next year. That's, uh, that's hope, you see. All hope is built on something. My hope that I will preach a series of sermons on the four Advent candles is based on two things. One, that Advent will come again. Two, that I will live to see. Now, I could be wrong on both counts, but that's hope. Of course, my hope of salvation is built on something entirely different something much more firm a foundation. I'm pretty sure 
that we have all got at least one friend or acquaintance who believes that because they were baptized at some time in the far distant past that they are guaranteed to arrive in heaven when they die. No matter that they haven't been to church since or that they do whatever they want to, whenever they want to, whether it's a good or bad thing. They have that hope. But I assure you that that hope, well, there's not a lick of truth to it. Getting ourselves dumped or sprinkled at some particular age in the distant past has absolutely nothing to do with whether God will allow us into heaven or not. That belief that we can obligate God by getting baptized to allow us into heaven when the time comes, well, there's just not a lick of truth in it. I know more than a few people who believe that because they come to Sunday school and worship every Sunday, they were baptized when they were 12 years old, just like they were supposed to be, are guaranteed that they are going to heaven when they die. I'd be willing to bet that most of you know someone like that, but I wouldn't be willing to bet that there's nobody like that in the room. That's hope for sure. But I know for a fact that attendance in Sunday school and worship and baptism when you're 12 years old will not get the conductor on the train that's bound for glory to punch our ticket. I have even met some people who believe that either they or some dear departed relative of theirs had lived such good lives that God can't help but let them into heaven and grant their salvation whether they went to Sunday school and church or not or ever, whether they darkened the door to the church building for any occasion, even funerals, they are going to get into heaven based on their good works. Well, you know what? It just ain't so. None of us can live a life so good that God can't help but let us into heaven. There is not one thing that we can do they can put God under contract to give us anything. We certainly cannot deserve to arrive in heaven. The only thing that God has ever owed any of us is a one-way ticket to hell. And that's certainly not what we're hoping to get on the day that we leave this life. So, it's not baptism. It's not Sunday school and worship attendance. It's not living good lives. Well then, what is it? How many of us know that old song, The Solid Rock? Anybody here know The Solid Rock? Anybody here can tell me the first two lines of The Solid Rock? Don't look in the hymnal now. We don't have that long. What are the first two lines of The Solid Rock? She's trying to cheat. She was here last night. <laughs> Anybody can help me out of here? Boy, I tell you what, we're going to have to start. What? 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 My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. Almost. We had the same mistake last night. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm supposed to get an amen here. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I hope our hope is not built on anything other than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Because that's when we fail so desperately. The words we just read from Scripture are the inspiring words for that song. <laughs> Listen to verse 5 again. Paul said, He saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. Our hope is, of our salvation is not built on anything we have done or can do. We just can't be that good. We can want to, 
We can try hard to be, but we are not going to be that good day in and day out all the time. I've probably said this before, but I'll say it again. I got an old preacher friend who swears that one day he, in his life, he only sinned three times. He had a bad fever, laid in the bed unconscious most of the day. That's the only way we can manage not to sin, to be knocked out. Well, how did Jesus become our Savior? He became our Savior by being the righteous one. The Son of God who died on the cross when His blood was poured out, as Peter said, once for all. We celebrate every Sunday morning, every time disciples gather together, we celebrate at the Lord's table. We remember that Jesus' body was broken and His blood was shed on the cross for us and for our salvation. And that's the gospel. That sacrifice that Jesus made for us releases us now it releases us it sets us free from all of the eternal consequences of our sins it doesn't set us free from the temporal consequences we do something wrong with one another the court will fix that there are earthly consequences temporal consequences there are everlasting consequences too but Jesus has taken that burden away. We do not have to pay any longer <clears throat> the eternal consequences of our sin. That's mercy. We can't see mercy, can we? Not with a microscope or a telescope, we cannot see God's mercy. We can't hear it or smell it or taste it. We can't experience it in any way. We cannot prove it with chemical tests. We cannot prove it with mathematical equations. We cannot see it, prove it at all. And if someone comes up to us and says, well, I'll be a Christian if you can prove something to me. We can. That's the reason they set it up that way. They didn't want to believe anyhow. Since we can't see it, experience, or prove it, that's why we call it hope. <clears throat> we hope for all that we read and know, for all that God has revealed to us, since we cannot experience it or prove it, we hope that it is true. You know, Jesus' sacrifice doesn't just set us free from the everlasting consequences of our sin. There's more to that. Paul went on to say, I want you to stress these things. Jesus' righteousness and mercy. So that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. We are not just set free from the everlasting consequences of our sin, but we are set free to devote ourselves to doing what is good. Just imagine, all the Christians in the world, if all the Christians in the world understood themselves not only to be set free from the consequences of their sin, but to be set free for doing what is good. And then understanding that they were set free in order to do what is good, they did it. Imagine that. That's something to hope for. 